Good afternoon. Hello. <laughs> so my name is Pamela Hill. I'm from a very sunny South Africa, which is a little strange to be in a very rainy Copenhagen. But we have 11 official languages in South Africa. But I'm not going to agree to you in every single one of them, but rather just in one. In my mind, it's the most beautiful one. And it's a Zulu greeting, Sawubona. It means, I see you, you are important and I value you. Thank you for coming to my talk. So my talk today centers around a project, which you might have guessed from the title of my talk, is a full stack web app written in Kotlin. And we'll be going, how I, going through how I created this talk, layer by layer from back to front end. So my project is a vision board, and it's called Life Visualizer. Now, according to Wikipedia, the source of all truth, it is a, a vision board is a collage of images and photos and affirmations of one's dreams and desires, designed to serve as a source of inspiration and motivation. How does it work? Well, let's have a look. Right, so we're going to start by registering a user. I just want to see that this is playing. No. Pardon, I just want to check that this is playing. Okay, I'll just talk you through it. So what we start by doing is we register a new user and then we go through to a I think it might play now. We go through to a little um, screen where we can add some, some inspirations, like you can see over here. So then we search for something that's interesting, that we want to make our life goals. And that would be something like cuddle a cute cat. That sounds like a life goal, right? So I use an API called Unsplash to select some, or to find some nice images that matches a keyword cat. And then I create a little inspiration byte. You can see it in the middle at the bottom. My next um, inspiration was to see the northern lights. So what I go ahead and do then is I select the picture, I add some tags to it, and then I create that inspiration. And then I do some filtering on it. It was very impressive. I'm so sorry you can't see it. But this is what a completed life visualizer will look like. So I want to see the northern lights. I want to visit Rome and Barcelona, and I want to move to Cape Town, because I'm from a very small, weird town called Portoria. And I also want to meet my boyfriend, Sean's cats, and I want to go shark cage diving, because that's a thing that people do in Cape Town. Right, so let's have a look at all how all those moving parts fit together. Now, starting from the bottom, we have a web app written in Kotlin.js, and it uses the Axios library to connect to some REST services on a KTOR server via HTTP. And that KTOR server connects to that API, the Unsplash API that provides us with images. They're nice and high quality, but royalty free. And that KTOR server uses a KTOR client, just for variety, to connect to the API over HTTP. The KTOR server also saves some user data. So we save that into a H2 database through the exposed library. But the purpose of my talk isn't just to show how to build a full stack web app. I could do that, but that sounds a little bit boring. So my project also has a philosophy behind it, and it's the philosophy of beautiful code. But that's a pretty vague concept, right? Yeah. So Ward Cunningham, a very famous programmer, actually made a statement about beautiful code that might clarify what I mean by it. He said, you can call it beautiful code when the code makes it look like the language was made for the problem. And one of the many ways in which Kotlin shines is the way that it allows us to create beautiful code and beautiful DSLs. 
So not only are we going to be using, we're creating this full stack web app, but we're also going to meet and say hi to some really beautiful DSLs along the way. I just want to quickly align with everyone. Everyone pretty sure what a DSL is? Just show hands. You, you know what a DSL is? Okay, that should be everyone. Just a quick rec recap. It's a domain-specific language. An internal DSL is written in Kotlin, but it's still a DSL. A normal DSL would be SQL, um, yeah, SQL or regex, whereas an internal DSL is the ones that we're going to be looking at today. It's written in a general-purpose language. But why would we want to use DSLs? Well, firstly, DSLs are declarative, so they're really focused on describing a problem or the solution rather than how to get there. So they're also super, super concise. Great DSLs can be very readable, and some Kotliners call this fluency, reading almost like natural language. Good DSLs also make it very clear what the original author intended to do, so the original developer, and that makes it easier to understand and code, adapt our code to new requirements without introducing some extra bugs. And while that's not all there is to maintainability, it's a really great place to start. So what makes Kotlin a great language for DSLs? Well, Kotlin helps us, and this list was actually presented by Venkat Sabramaniam at the last Kotlin Conf, so kudos to him. Um, some of the language features that support creating those fluent DSLs are the optional semicolon, which removes a lot of syntactic noise. Infixing functions that improves our readability, our readability. not requiring that last parentheses around our last lambda argument, also removes a lot of syntactic noise. Operator overloading using conventions, which gives us a nice shorthand notation, extension functions that make our code more, our existing code more fluent, and maybe two relatively unknown language features, lambdas with receivers and the invoke convention. Just a quick show of hands, lambdas with receivers. Anybody know what that is? Okay, we will be going through that quickly. Because it's actually a very um, important way of understanding how most DSLs are constructed. So, my, my one friend always says, she, when she hears lambdas with receivers, she always thinks llamas with hats. And I'm like, that is the most absurd thing that I've ever heard, but okay, llamas with hats. So, lambdas with receivers are lambdas that are executed within the context of a receiver. What does that mean? Well, it's a lambda that has a receiver object. And the receiver object is inside that method implementation is represented with the this context object. But it's always nice to have a look at an example, so let's have a look at one. Say that we wanted to create a lambda with receiver where we want to determine whether the, in, where the integer is even. And that's what the type would look like. We have an int receiver, we don't take any parameters, and we return a boolean. Inside the implementation of this function, or lambda, the this context object refers to the int receiver. And we just do our normal old calculation of the number modulo 2 equals to 0 to determine if it's 0. And when we want to call um, this lambda, we just use the regular old way, which is very fancy if you're in Java. But for us Kotliners, this looks a little bit like an extension function, but it's actually a lambda with receiver. Ooh. So, <clears throat> on to our next section. So we will be going through Ktor, Exposed, and also the um, Kotlin X HTML as DSLs and building everything step by step. So we start with Ktor, which is a Kotlin framework for creating asynchronous servers and clients. It's nice and open source, but it is created and maintained mostly by JetBrains. For Ktor, we use a DSL and in order to create our application behavior. 
And it's also really, really easy to set up. We'll be looking at how to actually go ahead and set it up. But you can either use the IntelliJ plugin or you can use the generator at start.kator.io. Interesting enough, ThoughtWorks, which is has a has a technology radar, and Kator actually featured on this uh, radar quite recently under the trial category, and it's been slowly making its way from, you know, a very experimental, be wary of it, to something that's trialing. So, in other words, try and use this project on a project can that they can actually handle the risk, but it's probably a good bet. So this is what they said about Ktor. They said the flexibility to incorporate different tools in addition to its lightweight ar architecture makes Ktor an interesting choice for, cre for creating RESTful services. So let's have a high-level look at how the Ktor application is structured. So a Ktor application has one or more modules that are user-defined, and each module implements a part of the application logic by installing and creating, configuring features. So a feature has a particular functionality that it does, and it, does, it intercepts some requests and responses, and then performs something, a little function. So examples of features include authentication, routing, logging, and content negotiation. Kator supports HTTP 1, 2, and also WebSockets. And once a request comes in, it's converted to an application call, and that application call flows through a pipeline of interceptors. Now, this is what the normal interceptor pipeline will actually look like. We have a setup phase for preparing the call and its attributes for processing, and then a monitoring phase for tracing, Features, where most features are going to intercept the pipeline. Calls for completing the call, the, where most features and interceptors that actually complete the call will run. And also a fallback phase for handling un, well, unhandled um, calls. So this is how you can set up a project. I realize that it's probably not so easily readable. I hope it is a little readable. But this is what it... The, what the website actually looks like. So we'll, let's go through it step by step. So creating the project is easy. You can either use the IntelliJ plugin and use it directly inside IntelliJ, or you can use this guy. So starting from the top left, we select our, uh, our build system, which can be Gradle or a Gradle with a nice Scotland DSL. I always sound like a chef when I say that, a nice Scotland DSL, and um, also Maven. Don't use Maven. Um, then we also can use, then we select our server engine, which is Netty, Jetty, um, Tomcat, or CIO, which is Kotlin, which is Coroutines IO, something from JetBrains. So then we select our KTOR version, which is currently 1.2.4 in stable. But if you're feeling a little adventurous, there's also 1.3.0 in beta 1. After configuring our Gradle, we go ahead and select some server features, which is going to be something like routing locations, which we're going to look at next. It's a pretty exciting feature that allows us to do routing in a typed way and also JSON for JSON serialization. Because we're going to be using the Ktor client in the Ktor server, we also use the HTTP client engine and we also use some JSON serialization stuff. So, Let's have a look at how we actually create the, the application. So we need to do two things. We need to create the application module and set up the server. So because our application is quite small, I had about maybe eight routes. Um, we'll only really have one module, which I called Life Visualizer. And if the application is bigger, you're going to split up your application into multiple modules that handle separate areas of your application. So we create a module using an extension function on application, do some um, feature installations, and also do some routing. Then inside the main function of our application, we go ahead and create our server, which is based on Netty, listing on port 8080, 
and with a, our Live Visualizer application module configured in. We start the server, it waits for calls to come in, ta-da. Right, so our next task is to actually go ahead and install some features. We install the content negotiation feature and also routing. So let's start with content negotiation, which is going to do the JSON serialization for the app. We simply say install with a feature name, and then we configure that feature. Here we're just using saying that we want JSON to be used as our content negotiator. Routing is automatically installed because we use Ktor mostly for routing. Um, so we actually only have to configure it. Um, so the way that we configure it is by defining some routes. And in order to define that route, well, we just say it's a get call and with a path. It's pretty simple, right? So um, let's zoom in on, okay, well, let me just tell you what the two routes are. The first one will get that selected amount of, like a sample size of images from Unsplash and return that based on some keywords. The second route um, gets a user's, a specific user's uh, inspirations, life inspirations. And I wish that I could have shown you the demo because that would have clarified a lot. But, you know, the demo gods or whatever you want to call them. Mm. Right. So let's have like zoom in on that first route because that's going to clarify how we do our route configuration. Okay, so we need to get our keywords query parameter from the request. So we use the call object to get that. But what is this call object and where is it coming from? Well, call is just a way of representing the request and responses. And it's actually just an extension property on that, conf that root configuration block body. So we use the parameters map to get the keywords. And then we check, was, did we get a nice client that sent us something through? Or did they forget? So if the keywords is null, we use call to respond with a bad request response. But if the keyword is not null, we go ahead and search the Unsplash API with our keywords. We also then, if we get some results, we say, okay, the HTTP status is okay, and we hand the inspirations through. But if we couldn't find anything, if I typed in ASDF, uh, I would get nothing from Unsplash because what does an ASDF picture look like? Anyway, so then we would actually go ahead and get a no, con we would actually respond with no content. So this looks okay, but it's, it can actually get better. So let's have a look at two refinements that we can actually go ahead and make on this um, piece of routing code. So our first, our first refinement is locations. And all this manual retrieval of the query and the path parameters can result in quite a lot of boilerplate. So it's, in order to minimize this boilerplate that we've got, in a nice type safe way, we can use locations. Um, but note that it is still experimental. So you're going to get warnings all over the place. And the first thing we need to do Install locations. It's a typical pattern. Install, configure. Um, next, we need to define the locations with at location. Um, the annotation, and we also have our path. And we also need to create a data class that is going to hold in, uh, hold all our parameters and things that we want to get from the request. And then the last step is to actually go ahead and use that um, data structure that we just created. So we get a specific um, data class or a specific data structure, and, uh, and we template that get with that data structure that we just created. And inside that block where we actually go ahead and do the routing, we can, we can refer to that generic template as it. Um, which might be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on readability. But you can use it to get to the keywords. And the rest is pretty much the same, but we've cleaned up the code significantly. 
Our next refinement is really for a little bit larger than toy server. So all these root definitions can quickly get out of hand. It, it gets pretty long the more root definitions you actually add. So it would be nice if we could split them into separate files, and we can. So each root is actually an instance of root class. And by defining an extension function on root, we can go ahead and put that in its own file. And then we just refer to that function from application. And then it's, it's a really simple change, but to me it made a world of difference. So let's have a look at how we actually get those images into our app. So first we have to, un to register with Unsplash, which provides these amazing photographs. Um, and we also need to describe our app to Unsplash so that we can ac get access to an access and a secret key. And most of the API was put behind some OAuth security stuff, but luckily not for the services that we call. We just have to pass on an auth header that has the access key. So that made it a lot simpler. So to retrieve the images from Unsplash, we're going to use the Ktor client. And here we conf configure it with CIO, although we could have used Apache or JT as well. And we install our JSON feature, we tell it, please use JSON, and that's about it. We do a little bit of extra configuration just to handle the nulls and the escaping a little bit better. To search the photos, we have to create a suspending function. Now, remember suspending, because so we create a suspending function that takes in our keywords and returns us a result of inspirational images. And it's really important that this is a suspending function because it's a long-running operation. So previously, I actually went ahead and read Unsplash, the Unsplash URL, and also the access key, and we're going to use them now. So we create our URL, and we use HTTP client to initiate the get call on that URL. And we also define a header, which I spoke about earlier, that does the auth stuff with our access key. And then we just go ahead and map the results that we get um, to our internal data structure. So in the beginning of my talk, I, I was talking about beautiful code. So let's think about what we just saw with the Ktor DSL. Is it beautiful? In the first iteration, maybe not so much, right? But in the following iterations, the framework and the language actually helped us refactor it to get rid of boilerplate and to also kind of manage complexity a bit more. It didn't require a lot of setup. And I'm not talking about the project setup, I'm talking about the code. It literally was just a small application file, and that's pretty cool. Routing was really easy to read and understand. So yes, I think, I think that this DSL was probably be quite beautiful. So Exposed is a SQL library for Kotlin. And once again, it was created and it's, uh, it's open source, but it was created and maintained by JetBrains mostly. And Exposed has a DSL that you use to specify your database operations, which we're going to look at now. But it also has a DAO or data access object version that you can use. And it supports a lot of different versions, a lot of different traditional databases like. Postgres and MySQL, but for the Android people in here, they also have um, SQLite and also H2, which, which is what we're going to use here. H2 is a little in-memory database. So to set up our stuff, we need to create, we need to do two things. We have to first get all the dependencies into our project, and here we're saying, please, please place H2 exposed and Hikari CP in our project as compile time dependencies. Hikari CP is used for connection pooling. 
Our next step is to create our Hikari data source, um, the database, and set up our table. So we have three tables. It's users for the users, inspirations, which is for our for saving, kind of connecting the users and the inspirational images, and also tags. So this is what a table definition looks like, and it's pure, pure Kotlin. It's a, a singleton object that um, extends table, and inside that table definition, we have different columns, and they're all represented by vowels. The first two are the most interesting. The first uh, column is basically ID, and it's just a normal character column, but it's defined as a primary key. The second one, user ID, is also normal, normal character column, but it ref references another tables column, so it's a foreign key. And we would actually go ahead and create the other two tables similarly. Now, I found a little piece of Kotlin magic in the middle of my research for this talk. And it's this. It's called the DB operation. And most database operations have to run on the right thread. And it should sometimes runs in a transaction as well. So this little function makes sure that you're actually running on the right thread for IO and also in its own transaction. It's really simple. But it's actually pretty effective because we use it all over the place. So this is how we would go ahead and insert a row into the table. Remember the table that we just created called inspirations? Well, it's in order to actually put a user's inspirational image into that table, we call insert on that table with a little configuration block that's going to tell us how to alter that, that row. The it context object refers to the row, and the this context object refers to the table. So it's maybe not so readable, um, especially maybe the it. It might be a little confusing. So um, to, to, take, to take into consideration whether it's readable, but it is quite concise. So here is also where we're going to use our little piece of Kotlin magic. We wrap the whole thing in DB transaction, which is going to take care of the threading and also the transactions for us. So here we just assign all the values to the row, and that's our database alteration code. Let's look at querying some data. Um, say that we want to get a specific um, a specific user's inspirational images by ID. So once again, we're working with the inspirations table, and we use the select function. Here we have an interesting little piece of expression code, um, a little SQL-like expression that is going to uh, refer to the column first and then the value. So inspirations.id equals ID. That reads quite nicely, don't you think? It reads like it, the column equals the value. It's pretty nice. And then we have a, a collection functions that we use to uh, map the, our, our internal data structure and kind of pass through all the row values to it. And then we just make sure that we have just one result. What I wanted to point out next or last is really, is this DSL beautiful? And what I really liked about this, about this DSL is that it was pretty much following SQL very closely, which I think is a good thing if you know SQL. And I think most developers have seen a little bit of it before. So I think that that is got, you know, it's, it's counting a lot. And also the use, the use of the this and the it objects, the context objects, actually can make your code nice and concise. But considering some previous talks that we've had, I've actually kind of rethought this and thought it could be a good thing, it could also not be a good thing. You have to evaluate for yourself. But what I really liked about this DSL was the little query that we could do. 
And it has, um, Exposed has a whole language um, that you can actually use to define your queries. And it's nice and concise and expressive. And, if, and it reads a lot like natural language. So yes, I think that it is beautiful. Our last section for the talk is really about building the front end. So I used React as a front end framework because JetBrains provides a, a, a wrapper library for React. And that was a massive time saver. So we'll also be looking at a DSL for creating HTML, which is called cottonx.html. And finally, I'm going to show you how to use a JavaScript library and kind of wrap it around, um, uh, wrap Kotlin around it so that we can use it normally. And that we're going to use to connect to our KTOR servers, REST services. Just a little bit of React background. So in React, um, large screens are decomposed into smaller components. And this is kind of reminding, the, when I was attending some of the Jetpack Compose talks, it kind of reminded me of this. So our large components are broke up in, broken up into medium components, which are broken up into smaller components. And the larger component, or parent, creates the smaller component, or child. So when that co child component is created, we pass properties down from the parent to the child. But the events, it's maybe a button click in the child, will flow up so that the event, so that the parent will actually know that there has been an event and they can handle it. So in summary, the properties flow down, but the events flow up. And this is exactly how Jetpack Compose also structured its stuff. So to, to actually set up the project, you go ahead and use some NPM modules, and that makes it nice and quick. So it's first necessary to install the project creator, and then you can use that project creator to create your own project. We use NPM start, which will run the project in the browser and also do some live reloading. To create a component in Kotlin slash React, we need to do uh, five things. First, we define a properties interface. So that is the one where we pass from the parent to the child a couple of properties. We define a state interface for all the internal state of the application. We create the component finally with templated with those two um, interfaces. We have to create a render method um, that is compulsory. And we're going to use a nice little Kotlin HTML, Kotlin X HTML DSL for that. And lastly, we create a builder. So it's nice and quick for a parent component or another component to go ahead and use that component. So to create the properties interface, I need to extend our props. And then we pass through all the um, properties that we want the parent component to, to send through to the child. Now, this, unfortunately, you haven't seen the demo, but there is a photo selector component where you can select an image. So maybe we have all kinds of different pictures of cats. So we select the, uh, the cat that we like the most, and that will be our little component. It will transition to the next component where we actually do the title and the tags and, and so on. Um, but that is the component that we're going to be looking at. And for this component, we are going to notify the parent component when a photo has been selected. So the parent component actually needs to pass down a callback function so that the child can call it back. The state interface, um, we need to, in order to actually implement that one, we need to extend our state. And we list all the variables that will form internal state of that component. So in the case of photo selector, we're going to have a list of search results of just images based on the keywords that we typed in, which in this case is cats. To create the component, we extend our component, and we have our two interfaces that we template with it. Inside, and this is compulsory, we need to have a render method. It's a scoped function on our builder. But you can also override some lifecycle functions and create your own functions too. Now, in the render method, um, I created, so 
just a little bit, bit of background, I used the Material Design Web Components Library. And all that I really needed to do was to put some CSS and JavaScript in my project and also a bunch of HTML tags. So the reason why I did that is because I wanted it to look pretty for you. Um, so we wanted to create, we, okay, so the first thing that we need to do is we extend, we, we have an extension function on um, our builder called render. And the first line over here actually just creates a div with two classes and some text. And that forms the title of our little page. The next one will form the card. Um, and it, what I want to illustrate here is that you can actually go ahead and nest some divs, pretty much like HTML. But this is not HTML. This is definitely, definitely Kotlin, because here, I'm iterating over some things. I'm iterating over those photos in order to make our cards for each photo. So to make it as easy as possible to, to use that photo selector, selector object um, component, we actually have to create a builder for it. Now, each builder pretty much looks the same for each component. It follows a similar pattern. And here we create an extension function on our builder we, that you pass on all the parameters um, that you want to actually use as properties. So inside the method, um, we use our builder's child function and we pass in what we want, the component we want to create, and also all the properties that we want to assign. And we do just do the assignment of the parameters and the properties there. But maybe you're wondering, okay, this is nice, but I don't want to use React. Maybe you want to use something else. So how do we actually go about using just any old JavaScript library that isn't already wrapped for Kotlin? Let's have a look. So say that we wanted to use Axios, which is a library for connecting to just normal REST services over HTTP. And we wanted to use that one to connect to the KTOR server to get all our user data. So the first thing we need to do is use npm to install Axios. That will make sure that it's nice in the project in, in the node modules section. We then create some external functions and interfaces. So the important thing here is that it's marked with external and that it's going to mimic what is happening in the JavaScript. And then we pretty much use these external interfaces and functions like regular old Kotlin. So here we can see that after installation, we've got this node module in our project. And Axios is actually just a normal little function that we pass in a configuration object and we get a promise of results back. So our first step is actually to define those interfaces. Now, here you're a little bit on your own. You have to look at either the source, the source code or the documentation that is associated with whatever JavaScript project you're looking at. And then you have to create your, little your normal Kotlin interfaces that mimic their JavaScript ex equivalents and mark it with external. That's really, really important. Our next step is to have our Axios function. It's just a normal function. And we just, give the fun it's, we just actually give the function signature and mark it external. So once again, external is really key here. We also have to link the in what's, whatever is in node modules with the function. So we use the at js module notation for that. And our last step is just to um, call that function actually. So we, it's, it's, it's pretty much what you would expect. It's normal Kotlin, except for one thing. And it's, we're using a JS object to create that little piece of um, interface that will configure that call with the URL, the method, and the timeout. And this is part of the Kotlin JS libraries. So the rest is pretty much React specific, not all that interesting. But what's left for us to really consider about this DSL is, is it beautiful? 
it follows HTML quite closely, um, and there are very nice builder functions for it. But it also took the longest. It was very laborious and a little bit boring. So I would say it's kind of beautiful, but maybe not so much. It, it, it was a lot of work to actually create. So maybe. And with that, thank you. Bye, Dunkey. And remember to vote. <laughs>